Okay, all right, we do have Seamus take you back on the uh, the good old-fashioned uh, mobile phone. Seamus, how are you doing? Sorry, you were talking about the, the process you're going through at the moment to appoint a new CEO. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't, I don't know. Uh, Tipperary is great for coverage normally, but it's such a life. Um, uh, so basically what we've done for the last month and a half, every two months, was uh, we did a subcommittee of our of our, of our board uh, working on, on uh, what we're looking for in terms of our next CEO. Um, the advertisement is basically due out now in the next couple of days. Um, and we'll get that process in, up and running as fast as we, we can in that, in that sense. Tell us a little bit about um, what is actually the most important thing for the new CEO. I mean, I'm not looking for you in any way to prejudice who might apply or whatever, because obviously the GAA itself is going through a massive period of transition. There's a new president, there's a new director general, and um, again, as far as I know, the deal, the current deal that you guys have with the GAA has another year to run, so it'll be, yep. there'll be no real honeymoon period for a new CEO. It'll be straight in to try and renegotiate that. Yeah, pretty much. So basically the most important thing, and it's universal and pretty much all the things we do is we need someone who knows the players um, um, understands the players and basically represents the players well um, like you said it, the, I suppose the the environment has changed for uh, the GA, the GPA uh, in, especially in recent times with the new personnel on both sides so you know we've we're basically a stakeholder in our games our players are hugely important in our games we need someone who's going to represent them the best of, of our ability, of their ability, and uh, you know, someone that you know basically is empathetic towards the players, understands them, and, and uh, represents their interests as best they can. And would you hope that that person has a background in playing GA, or is that relevant or irrelevant? What, what's your feeling on that? So, so basically, that can be that can be twofold. So, it can be positive that uh, it's a past player and they fully understand uh, the dressing room. The dressing room itself has changed in recent years, so like you know, you'd want to actually refresh yourself. You know, even me, for you know, the last twelve years that I've been involved in it, the, the difference in the dressing room that I came into to what I'm in now is is in, entirely different. So even if you were a past player, you know, there is a, a need to understand the modern player and the modern game and what 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 the pressures are um, on and off the field for players there. So. You know, it can be a past player, it can be uh, someone who's just intimately familiar with the GA and with the players and the, the commitments they make. Uh, so, you know, it can be uh, a positive uh, and a negative to be, you know, to be in a dressing room and have been in a dressing room depends on uh, your openness and, and your understanding of the players uh, today. It's interesting you talk about the difference in the dressing room from 12 years ago to now and, and the experience of, of that from your own perspective. I imagine the players' understanding of the role of the GPA, the lads who are coming through right now who have the advantage of the gains that the GPA have made over the years, there's probably a sense that they take that for granted because that, that battle was fought and won a long time ago by the original group who set up the GPA. Is there any possibility that the current members, that the, the younger members, don't fully appreciate the situation as it was before the GPA existed? Well, they can't appreciate it, but they weren't there. You know, so, um, like it's it's all it's all basically uh, you understand what you're familiar with. Um, like the all the gains that we make for intercounty players and all the gains that have been made by the GPA for intercounty players are so that players been taken care of and players been you know uh, been able to balance their lives on and off the field is taken for granted. It's it so that it is the norm. You know, so. It comes with the territory that all the work that we have been doing for the last ten years is basically, you know, it, it's so these players today uh, don't have to experience the, the, I suppose, the scenario where you know going home without any eating anything after training, you know, uh, basically getting a pair of towels and a socks in June to play for their county, um, you know, and basically off, offsetting the expense of, of training and, and diet. Uh, entirely by themselves, so it's a lot. Of, a lot of the things that we've gained is so that they didn't know that uh, that history and that and that reality before. So it's it's understandable that players uh, don't understand what what the efforts were um, to get it. And even in the most recent negotiations, like the food allowance and the increased mileage rate, was for players and an entirely you know focused at. Um, offsetting the efforts and the commitments that they make to play the intercounty game uh, as an amateur, so you know those 
you know, in in a very short space of time, will be again the norm and will be will be seen as this is something that has always happened. Uh, when a huge amount of work went into to actually getting it uh, and the rationale behind it that was was so strong, so it, it happens. It's a generational thing. Um, you know, un- unless you unless you've lived through it, you don't understand it. Uh, it's the same in so many different scenarios in life. Yeah, of course, and but the, I guess the difficulty for a representative group like the GPA then is that people don't feel as aligned with the group because the stuff that got everybody together in the first place has been achieved, and then after that, it's, it's that next phase of what the GPA actually stands for and how the players identify with the GPA once the major battle of having that level of respect has been won. And I guess that's what the, the vision and the role of the next CEO is going to, that's why that role is important. Do you want somebody with a vision who comes and says, this is what we should be doing? Or do you want somebody who tries to get the players back into some kind of unified group and leverages the power of that group? Both. I've not been smart. Um, you know, absolutely somebody with vision uh, who, who sees where players and the players' body should be going, but also someone who the players can rally around. It's, you know, when you're going looking for um, the, the, the head of your organisation, you, you have to be ambitious. Um, there's exceptionally good people out there um, you know, for me, uh, I feel like the, the 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 environment is changing so much. We do need someone with vision. We do need uh, someone who can, you know, see where the GA is going because it is a rapidly changing organisation. Um, you know, see where that's going uh, and be, and make a make a strategy before before we, before we need it. Uh, but you know, uh, to your point, getting players. To fully identify and understand the work that the GPA does for them is difficult. Uh, so there's 2,300 members um, of the GPA uh, every year. That membership changes annually because panels change annually, um, and our communications that I suppose that we focus on um, very, very much so. Like so, communications to squads through our reps and through our welfare officers and our player development programs. You know, those communications are so, so important players to understand what we do for them and why we feel that, you know, all the all the services that we offer to both in, in uh, career business uh, and life outside of the game are so important for their playing of the game. Um, you know, a happy player is a good player. Um, and it's it's a mantra that's, that's, that's held by so many players associations, whether it's the, the New Zealand Rugby Players Association or, or the, the AFL Players Association, you know, you know happy players are good players. And it's communicating that message. It's a constant. You know, you can't take a break from it because of the the change in nature of our membership. You know, it's it's something that has to be a, a constant focus. Are you surprised by the level of vitriol that the GPA faces from within the GEA, from some very high profile commentators who seem hell bent on? Uh, painting you guys as um, a renegade crew who have taken a large portion of funding, who are poisoning the well from within, if you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. I am surprised. I'm surprised at a lot of the. I'm surprised at a lot of the, the, the commentary uh, and the rhetoric around the GPA. But, but listen, I, uh, a lot of it is from a lack of understanding of what the GPA does. Um, you know, in 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 the past, uh, we have focused almost entirely on. Communications with our membership, you know, something that we're trying to do a bit more now, um, and I suppose this is only a small bit of part of it. Talking to you this morning is to is to actually open up and to a wider kind of public audience, a wider GA audience, uh, so that they understand what we do and, and why we do it. Um, with understanding comes a, a bit less of the the polarized opinion, and and I suppose more of an informed opinion. Um, you know, it is frustrating sometimes when you do see inaccurate uh, and, I suppose, you know, inaccurate reports with that don't have the, the right information uh, assigned to them. You know, for one example, you know, our, you know, we were, the education scholarships that we give out, we were we were accused of being biased towards um, uh, high-profile players. That's not true. It couldn't be further from the truth. Every player who applied for an education scholarship in 2017 received one. Um, and that that goes for any player from um, north and south of the country. Uh, you know, so that takes huge huge commitment to 
providing the resources to make that happen so that we don't have to differentiate between players and we don't have to have a, 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 a tiered system within our membership. We don't want that. It's not something that we believe in uh, and it doesn't exist. So it's just an example of of misinformation and misunderstanding of, of what we do. You know, it's, uh, I suppose part of that is us communicating our message a bit better, us uh, using the platforms that we have to, I suppose, to give people a better understanding of what we do. The, the thing I won't apologize for is what we do for players and, and, and uh, the services we give to players. I'll always feel that there's more we can do for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I just have to communicate that. When you talked about being a, a stakeholder as well, I think that's one of the other issues that um, because the GPA was born from such a, a difficult relationship with the GEA, there was always an assumption that that was going to be the norm, that you know you, you start in conflict and that's what the relationship with the GEA is going to be. But by becoming a stakeholder and a partner with the GEA, um, there's that constant tension between what the GPA was and what it seems like you guys wanted to evolve into, which is somebody who's at the, the, the right tables and on the right committees and having those conversations with people on some kind of equal footing or at least as a, a voice that is guaranteed a hearing. And um, that evolution, I guess, is also something that um, probably needs to be explained and teased out a bit more often and a bit more regularly. Yeah, so in terms of that relationship, like, and like you said, the the I suppose, the effort uh, to get recognised in the first instance was a struggle. It, it was, uh, and the, the founders of the GPA uh, had to go against enormous resistance. Uh, basically, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of it was fear of the unknown as to what this group uh, of, of, of players, what it means for the game. You know, I, I think we've seen in evidence the last number of years the positive effect that a strong, a, a strong players group does for the game. The games have only strengthened in terms of the playing of them um, and in terms of what players bring to the table. You know, at the end of the day, without them, the games don't happen. Uh, so, but the, the relationship that has, that has grown and developed from there, it, it has to be a working relationship that is based on respect. Like, the, the, our relationship with the, the past year presidents uh, since our establishment has been quite, quite, quite good. You know, to my own relationship with Egon O'Farrell in for the last few years was, was excellent. I have huge respect for him. Um, the Arch Stuart Hoare, uh, both past and present, we've had close working relationships with them in different in different roles uh, and different committees and different functions and in different, uh, I suppose, uh, different ventures. So, you know, we have to work with them on daily uh, because we are partners. So there has to be a, a healthy level of respect there. But... To that, the other side of that is when we need to act on behalf of players, when players voice um, a concern or an issue that we have to represent them on, we, we can't hesitate and we don't hesitate. And we do communicate uh, ex- regularly with the GA on so many different things that, uh, that come to us through the players' representatives on each squad, through our welfare officer or through our player development group. So it's a dialogue that, that is constant. Um, and it's something I suppose because it's not seen, it's assumed that it doesn't happen. Um, and it's it, I suppose the the perception of it is 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 not is not the reality. Um, insofar as you know, the the chummy relationship that people try to portray, there is a good relationship because we have worked really hard uh, at being you know uh, basically growing as an organisation and you know trying to influence our games for the better influence our games for the better we have to have a good relationship with the governing body um, and we have we, we have won so many games uh, from our places on committees such as the the, the games com- the games and rules committees you know so we have had influence you know because it's not seen and because it goes unseen uh, I suppose the the perceptions then uh, shift uh, and I suppose we don't have control over those the only way we can control it over oh, control them is if we actually talk about it and communicate it a bit better, which is, I suppose, something we should try to do more and are trying to do more. Yeah, like you can't constantly be on the verge of going on strike because ultimately it means nothing and the relationship deteriorates. Just just on that kind of point about communication, is there a need for greater transparency? Do you feel like, the, I don't fully understand what the corporate structure of the GPA is, are you a not-for-profit? 
Are you a charity? Who owns the company? How does that work? How much has everybody paid? Is, that, is it important for those details to become public, do you think? Or do you feel, as a player's body, you actually have the right to, to maintain a certain degree of independence when it comes to that? Well, like, so, so in terms of... The, it's not a secret. Like, so we are, we are not for profit. Uh, we don't make a profit every year. and We, we don't have... Um, we don't have profits. We can't make them. Um, the, the the board of directors, and, and I suppose a lot of this information is on our website, which is a lot of the time why, you know, I, I don't understand why people feel that there's such a lack of transparency in the GPA. We have so much information about our organization on our website, from our organizational structure to our, our structure, from our board of directors down to our national executive committee uh, to our, um, our independent, independently chaired committees for remuneration, uh, audit and risk, um, and finance. So, you know, all we are set up as best we possibly can uh, with the, the, the structures to run a, a, a mature and, I suppose, responsible organisation. Um, we're, we're aligned to the governance code for charities. So the governance code for charities outlines a number of uh, voluntary... Um, regulations that you sign up to or voluntary um, requirements that you sign up to as an organization uh, for um, the running and, I suppose, the uh, accountability within an organization. And that goes from the members of your committees and the information that you communicate out about those committees uh, to the membership. We sign up to that voluntary and we are compliant with the governance code for charity. So it's, it's, it's something that, you know, this is this is stuff that is that is easily known and it's easily shared, um, and it's something like so. Most recently, in uh, we've presented to Art Corla uh, at the GA all of our all of these, I suppose, all these different aspects of our organisation that people like like well, like you just pointed out, sir, that people don't know uh, how we're organised. Um, you know, we publish our accounts, our annual report, held a published accounts. Um, you know, we we try to share as much information as we can. We've got nothing to hide, uh, and I suppose that's, we set ourselves up so we don't have anything to hide. Um, and our governance of the association is something that I'm hugely proud of. The development that has come from being uh, a number of founders in a room who uh, who fought very hard to exist. Now it's a, a, you know a mature, uh, well, it's maturing um, organization with you know structures that equal or are better than a huge number of long-established uh, not-for-profits in the country or even uh, in, around the world. Seamus, the uh, current agreement with the GEA expires next year, so presumably you'll be at the negotiating table next year with the GEA. And you mentioned the new Art Schurhor there a few moments ago. He comes from a finance background, Tom Ryan. He's going to drive a hard bargain no matter what the relationships he enjoys with the GPA. So do you see that becoming any bit confrontational at all, just for the sake of uh, keeping the coffers in good nick from a GEA perspective? Like, listen, so the, the negotiations the last time around were, were similar. So, like, we... we, we Again, we had a very good relationship with the, the Art Stewart and the President uh, for the last round of negotiations. But it's, it's, it's basically it's for us to get the best deal that we can for our players. And the needs of the players change so rapidly as the years go on that we have to be constantly listening to them, know what they want, and then represent them well at the negotiating table. The fact, whether it's Tom Ryan, um, for, you know, a former financial director of the of the, of the GA, or whether it was someone who's who's coming from very much an administrative background in the GA, they will have the best interest of the GA at heart, and that's the the interest that they'll bring to the negotiating table. You know, it, it is what it is. Um, one way or the other, we're going to represent our players strong. That that's going to happen one way or the other. Um, so these kind of uh, agreements are, are um, that, that we that we signed to GA. We've, we've we've two in our history. This will be the third. Um, this is just part and parcel of the relationship we have with them. Uh, we're prepared for it. We know we we know what we're going into when we go into it. One last point, um, Seamus. Uh, the the issue of fundraising in the USA has come under the spotlight um, because the either a recent fundraising event in Boston. Yeah. Um, just explain to us a little bit about why you guys fundraise in the USA and how that works for you. So the, the, the history of fundraising in, in the GPA, so uh, at the, as, I suppose at the, the genesis of the GPA, 
uh, or the GPA, we were self-funded. Um, we we had a commercial deal with um, Club Energize at the time, which was one of our main incomes. Um, and we had no f- official recognition with the GPA. GA. Um, our founders um, basically took an, a, a kind of a, a mission over to the, the USA to raise awareness of, the, I suppose, the commitments and the role that the intercounty player in Ireland plays in our national sport, the, the leaders that they are on and off the field and would say the role models that they are in, their, in the community. So they went over with that ambition, that set, uh, I suppose, developed a, a network of, of supporters, of, of highly influential people in the US um, to help fund, uh, at the time, our players' our players' programs uh, and player sports and development, including scholarships. So then with the, with the uh, agreement with the GA, GA, when we set up our uh, players' development programs, uh, in, I suppose, in earnest, and I suppose our, our programs of career and financial advice are... CV support, our um, interview skills, workshops, our education and upskilling for for careers, and all of the different programs that we have. Uh, you know, the demand among players started to increase, and without the funding that we receive from the the US fundraising, uh, we wouldn't be able to fund it. We, basically, what we'd have to do is we'd have to restrict the services that we offer to our membership and pare back what we what we already do. The fundraising effort in the U.S. is is, is essential to some of the, 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 I suppose, the key programs that we run. Uh, the Madden Leadership Program that we run is an accredited leadership course uh, by the National University of Ireland, Maynooth. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the funds that we generate uh, in the U.S. You know, we're not over there for the sake of being over there. We're over there with a purpose. All the money that we generate over there is used towards funding our players' association. In in recent years, uh, part of the U.S. funding has been used to support our our our, um, our friends in the, in the WGPA. So we've we have you know actively contributed to their to their uh, running and I suppose the successful growth of their association. You know, so the, the, without an independent revenue stream to supplement what the GAA gives us we wouldn't have uh, the resources to provide what we do for players. And that's the reason that we're over fundraising. One of the concerns is that um, you're taking money from the local GAA scene there, that you're fishing in the same pools as the New York County Board or the Boston County Board or, or whatever it is, wherever the organizations are. Um, how do you answer those claims? So this is, this, is something that, this is something that we were aware of before we went over there. And the, the New York GAA were, were uh, a stakeholder that we... We got in contact with and developed a relationship with early um, in our, in our I suppose our ventures into into New York. Um, when Desi and Don Logue went over day one, um, there was an understanding with the New York GA that they wouldn't go after any established GA uh, supporters there. And what they what they did was target a group of people who who wouldn't have been oriented towards GA, who didn't have a GA background and weren't established supporters of uh, New York GA. So. We deliberately tried to stay out of the same pool as New York GA, and it was something that I suppose it, it, I suppose it was never understood uh, here. But that was a relationship with the New York GA that we that we established early and maintain to this day. Um, our relationship with Boston GA has been very good because of our, the work we've done around Super 11 and how we've included them in our planning and and, uh, and running of the, the two Super 11 events we've had in Boston. Uh, we have this year again um, uh, sat down with the, the North American GAA uh, board to explain what we're what we're doing in Boston to uh, help them understand the, the you know our activities, what we're doing, and, and who we're talking to, so that they don't feel that they are being you know infringed in any way. So it's it's uh, it's something that we actually have to constantly communicate with the stakeholders over there. But it's something we do. It's something that we identified early as, as I suppose, uh, uh, it could be a problem if basically the local GA uh, boards uh, took umbrage for what we were doing. So we made those relationships early.
Yeah, it seems from what you're saying there that the pool is big enough for all these different parties to enjoy the resources that are on offer in the United States. But at the same time, then, the president of New York, GEA, has issued a hands-off warning to a certain extent, not to you directly, but to county boards for two years to tell them to not bother coming to New York for the next two years because he certainly feels that the pool is only so big and it's being affected by these county boards coming over. Well, I suppose, in, especially in recent years, um, so in... in the, the GPA's presence in New York has gone is going back a, a, a long number of years, but I suppose what we did see was a number of county boards and some clubs actually uh, uh, going over and doing the same. Uh, it becomes very condensed, uh, but it, it, you have to understand that the, the philanthropy pool in the US is 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 quite large. Uh, again, it depends on the it depends on the. the the supporters that you're that you're engaging, the people you're talking to, um, the GA world in the US is finite size. It is only it is only so big. So I fully understand you know their sentiments there, and I suppose that's to my point. That's why when we went over initially, it was to uh, I suppose to to endeavour uh, to find a new support base that had no uh, GA ties or or, uh, or connections in that sense. Seamus, last point, just to recap, you should, we should all expect to see the job advertised this week or next week for the new exactly, CEO? Exactly that, yeah. So in the next, in the next uh, five to seven days, yeah. All right, good stuff. Seamus, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks for your time, guys.